swirling yes. fin, the swish really? of deep, disturbed currents, the glint of an Good enormous Good evening. Eye. This is the, the world June meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board, and as my last official function, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the new chairman of the, the school board, Jan Solon, and to pass the gavel to her right after I make a few comments. Uh, some of you who were here last month will have noticed that I was somewhat surprised to receive a plaque commemorating my 11 months as uh, but before the chairman of the school the board, board it would come. and I was a little surprised mm -hmm. because I still had a month to go and, and so I uh, well rather than view that as an eagerness to have me move on I, I view it as the start of a new tradition and uh, so from now on we'll we'll give plaques to our outgoing chairman after 11 months and hope they do a reasonably good job for the final month continue to merit it but it uh, it didn't give me an opportunity I was unprepared uh, to offer any reflections on the year uh, and but more important than that I uh, was sufficiently nonplussed uh, that I did not comment on two very significant uh, events that took place that night and uh, those were the resignation and the resignation hyphen uh, reassignment of Mary Jo Thompson and Barbara Powers and these two educators have made an enormous contribution to our schools in a number of different ways but what uh, I want to mention particularly tonight uh, is the field of arts I don't know how many of you have gone to see performances in which your own children were not uh, involved when you go to see your own child of course you're really quite enthusiastic and uh, uh, generally pleased I, however, uh, as a school board member, went to a number where my child uh, was not a participant. And I'd just like to mention two of those because uh, there was something very important about them to me. Uh, one was the final session of the storyteller at St. Bartholomew uh, Church, uh, who told the children over a number of days uh, the story of the Odyssey. And it wasn't so much the storyteller's skill uh, and the fact that he held the children, you know, in rapt attention, it was the fact that when question time came, tens and dozens of hands went up. These children were obviously responding to this. Uh, their questions showed their curiosity and their creativity. And another event that I'd like to mention, and I certainly hope uh, a lot of you saw this one, and that was the black... Uh, uh, music evening at the uh, at the high school where the uh, I believe it was the fourth grade um, performed a number of uh, pieces from the black tradition one I particularly loved was uh, because I lived in Brazil for many years was the samba number in which uh, it was young Carl Burnett whirled around in a mask doing a dance which I immediately recognized for its authenticity but even beyond that there was a, an enthusiasm on the part of the students and their teachers took part in this too, incidentally, which I thought was just extraordinary. And I just felt that uh, we, we, of course, do have an award-winning uh, you know, art program uh, in which Barbara and Mary Jo played a, an important part. Uh, but what is it, why do I think it's so important? It's not just that I majored in arts in school, uh, goes well beyond that. I think that the creativity that one learns through the arts is terribly important. And whether you express that creativity through dance, through writing, through painting, through ceramics, through textiles, it's creativity. And finally, I just want to end with a very short story uh, to show you why that's important, why I think it's important anyway. My family has had a relationship with a Japanese family, which is now in its third generation. And my brother came back from Japan uh, after spending a month. He came back a few weeks ago. And he had the opportunity while he was there to meet not only with a lot of old friends, but also with government officials and with uh, some business people. And guess what they're worried about in Japan? They're worried about the fact that their children aren't very creative and they have identified and several of them told my brother this 
that in American schools, arts is one of the major elements in creating creativity. People who are inventive, people who can think for themselves, people who will take risks. Uh, and we have sat here a lot of this last year and we've uh, wrung our hands because uh, we're being outperformed by so many other industrial, uh, industrialized nations in the field of arts and science, uh, sorry, uh, mathematics, science. But I think we should remember at the same time that there are significant strengths in our system that they are looking at. And so while we want to elevate our system to meet their high standards in certain areas, we ought to remember that we're also setting a standard that they're trying to meet. So perhaps that's uh, overlapping into the good news department, but uh, I wanted to share that uh, with you. And those really will serve as my, my final remarks as chairman. I'll be around for another three years to make uh, remarks from time to time on other subjects. But uh, so I just want to end with uh, you know, words uh, of thanks to uh, Mary Jo and to Barbara, and uh, Barbara, particularly you, uh, we look forward to working with you in uh, the years to come. And with that, I, with great pleasure, pass the gavel. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, the first thing I would like to do as the new chairman is to welcome our new members on the school board, Rosemary Reed, Mark Foray, and Ann Chapman. We are very happy to have you, and we look forward to working with you in the years to come. And next, I want to thank Peter publicly. Um, at the last meeting, I know you received your plaque, but I want to say once again that you were just an outstanding chairman. You showed grace under pressure. Your financial and budgeting expertise are second to none. You were open and fair, and you guided us through a really difficult period. Now, as the new chairman, I want to lead us forward. We have all of the ingredients in this town to make our school system the finest it can possibly be. Our school board has a nice mix of experienced board members with perspective and new members who bring us interesting ideas. We have a new superintendent who brings us a sound knowledge of the mechanics of the school system as well as sound curricular ideas. We have administrators and teachers and staff who show remarkable dedication to the teaching of our children. We have parents who truly care and who are ready to help. We have citizens without children in school who may be in clubs or businesses or on other boards that can help us achieve our goals. And lastly, and the most important ingredient, we have the children. Our children come to school ready to learn. We as adults must not lose sight of the fact that we are working together for them. Is this system perfect? No. Have we made mistakes? Yes. Are there things we might have done differently? Yes. But we are now ready to join together all of the positive forces in our town and move ahead. And together we can make a difference. So I really am looking forward to this next year. Before we go on to the second um, item on the agenda, I just wanted to thank Nancy St. John for coming up with the folders that we all received for our agendas. We all got um, our agendas in folders that had been, that our artwork done by the students and they're just beautiful and it was such a pleasure to open the envelope and, and see <laughs> these. So thank you. <clears throat> the second thing is our adjustments to the agenda and there are, are actually two issues here. Um, the adjustments to the agenda is actually on there so that uh, the, the uh, superintendent and the other board members can add things or um, bring us up to, to speed on some things that might not have been included. Um, so that's the first thing I'll ask if, if there are any of those. This is not really um, put on there for people from the public to add things that are not on the agenda. But because we haven't done that in the past, we have allowed that to be a time for um, uh, items to be put on that are not on the agenda. Tonight, if there is anybody that wants to speak, we will add it on. 
Um, the one thing I want to do is review the ground rules for that. Um, if you're going to speak, you need to come to the podium, um, give your name and address, and there will be a three-minute time limit um, following basically what town council uh, does as far as allowing people to speak. This was something we talked about last night in our orientation meeting, which you'll hear more about uh, tonight. So I'll first of all ask, do board members or our superintendent have any adjustments to the agenda? Yes, I received a request from Wayne Dorr, the Director of Special Services, uh, regarding an invitation he's received to serve as an ISG for the state. And I suggest that we add that under personnel requests, which would be A, and add it under co-curricular positions. Any others? Um, Madam Chairman, I would like to uh, speak under communications item number six, please. Now, is there anybody here from the public that wants to speak on any of the agenda items or any items not on the agenda? Okay. Let's go on. Um, our approval of our school board minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to our minutes? Um, on page 71B, 8A, second paragraph, uh, Loretta Pond motion to accept the 1991-92 as distributed. I, I think we need to put the word calendar in there. Any others? Okay. It's my understanding that we actually do not have to vote on the minutes, that um, if there are no additional corrections, that uh, the school board minutes are approved as read. Okay. Next is our business manager's report. He is in the audience now, so he'll be up at the podium. Uh -huh. uh, page 81 of your agenda highlights the general program revenues for the 1991 school year uh, under column G to date we've received 7.991 million dollars out of a possible 8.86 or 90 percent of our anticipated revenues for the year keep in mind that the state is a month in arrears as far as uh, their payment of, of the uh, our subsidies uh, Last month, I also reported that the state uh, would be cutting our May subsidy by 10% or $15,000 for the month of May. That amount actually came out to be 4.88% or $6,700. The following page uh, highlights the general program expenditures. Then again, on page uh, 92A, to date, we have expended uh, $7.972 million, or 91% of our budget. Uh, looking forward to year-end balances, uh, year-end revenues. Our target of $50,000 as far as, as a carryover balance is still realistic. Uh, we are in the process of paying all bills as they come into the office now. We used to, to uh, schedule them and pay them within 30 days and set up folders so we would take advantage of discounts or whatever else. Now as they come in, we pay them so we can look at our year-end balances a lot closer. Any questions on this, yes, Loretta? I, I, under 37, the Children's Center, isn't that supposed to be a self-sustaining program? I see that it's $2,000. Uh, True, and uh, I believe the reason for that is last year uh, uh, the teacher was on a leave and we had to get a, a sub in and the teacher was still being paid on contract, therefore we incurred, uh, it was like two or $3,000. So we expect the True, tuition and, uh, to cover that. Yes, it is. And uh, looking at year-end balances, we anticipate to receive like $30,000 in that program. <clears throat> Uh, the following page on page 83 outlines the federal and state programs for the uh, 1991 school year. 
We have received all the monies, uh, the 91, the 90, I'm sorry, 9,711 for Chapter 2 came in last week. Uh, the state still owes us $185 for follow the child. Uh, we have a new grant that is not on this because it was, I just made uh, to my attention last week. It's called New England Foundation for the Arts. That was written by uh, and applied for by Mary Jo and some of her staff. And we will be receiving $2,000. And this is to help pay the, uh, the Art of Black uh, dance artists that just were on campus last week. Uh, over and above that, the only amount not received, I believe, is, that's it, that $2,000. Charlie. Can you just clarify for the board that the negative um, overrun on the Amer African American studies is not an overrun? That 335734. 2,000 of that will be transferred to the New England Foundation for the Arts grant that we will be receiving. The remaining, or 135734, will be uh, assessed or, or coded to the uh, K-5 Integrated Arts Program at the uh, 4 and 5 unit. They had budgeted $2,800 in their original budget last year for this particular artist. Along with the grants, along with other things, they will not need the $2,800. So we will have, well, whatever, the 13, so about uh, $1,500 left in that one account for that Thank particular you. artist. Uh, the following two pages, or three pages, outlines the food service program ending May 31st. Uh, here again, I think in page two. Looking at May totals, May we had revenues of $37,000 with expenditures of 31, with a cash or a cash to be realized profit of $5,600. Going again to column number O, the last column on your right, to date we have received $307,000 in the school lunch program with expenditures of 280, or a cash to be realized of 26,000. Keeping in mind that the, the first line or line number 10 up uh, under that column was a $25,000 transfer from the general program to the school lunch program. So if you were to uh, subtract that from the $26,000 profit to date, the school lunch program is in the black by $1,879. And that is quite a remarkable achievement, I think, for the, all the ladies in the food service program. Any questions on the school lunch? Jordan. How do you expect to end the year we have essentially this week? Let's go to uh, good question. Uh, June being naturally a, a uh, small month as far as revenues. However, last, no, it's included in that. Last week we did receive, or I'm sorry, before the, uh, the end of May, we did receive 30, it's either 33 or $4,300 from the state of Maine for uh, Additional subsidies. What they do is they set aside X amount of money, and they gave you. They gave us like three cents a meal as a bonus type subsidy for the 90-91 school year. All in all, I would estimate the revenues not to be all that great for the month of June, based on the number of days that are that are left in the school year. But then again, we're buying very little. Let's assume a break even or no cash realized for the month of June. We could end the year with. Uh, with, well, go to the following page, mm. with a, uh, a, uh, a fund balance of roughly $35,000 compared, I'm sorry, $9,224,000 compared to last year's 25000 at this time, plus in June of last year, we lost $11,000. <coughs> so we ended the year last year with $36,000 negative fund balance. You will close this account out and start over. That's correct. As we discussed last fall. That's correct. Okay. Now, I will close it. I guess I need a little more directive on that. I will close it as far as, as the cash or the fund balance. I think we ought to start each year with a, uh, with a zero balance cash. or with the budgetary allocation for that year. I mean, this year we had a $25,000 allocation. That's uh, what you're saying is that instead of losing the $25,000 that we expected to lose, we're now really only losing 23500 whatever the number is. L let's say that you have, if you're going to close it off as of this month, 
If I were closer for this month, you'd be in the board. No, I'd, I'd, I'd be making some money. You'd be making almost two thousand. I'd be making the the ninety two twenty four. As far as the fund balance, Peter. As far as the cash balance, I'd be making eighteen hundred bucks. I guess what I'm getting at, it's the eighteen hundred bucks that I'm getting at. That's okay. your on operations. I agree. So I think what we ought to do is start each year very clearly at zero, and then if we have a budgetary allocation as we do of twenty-five thousand dollars for this item. Uh, that's our subsidy, and we know that going in. Uh, but uh, that's my preference. I, uh, I think it's clearer. It's, it's hard to identify the fund balance because of the inventories. Well, I mean, depending on the commodities, other things that we might not be able to control. Well, I something. would count the uh, the inventories if they're usable in the next fiscal year. I would uh, count them against uh, the results. So then we would close. I would carry to them forward. Four B. Yeah. Okay. I would concur. So all in all, the school lunch program, you know, talking, we, they had the, uh, the uh, bid opening two weeks ago. It was held in, uh, in Cape Elizabeth this year where the, the co-op from York County and Cumberland County got together. And there was like 30-some schools being represented, and they opened the bids. And, you know, I spoke to a few of the uh, directors, and all in all, a lot of the other schools are experiencing a, a lot better year than they had last year. I don't know if the prices have leveled off or people are buying better, or but uh, and you haven't been reading about it much in the papers this year compared to last year where everybody was losing lots of money in school lunch. Uh, the following three pages highlights the community services program for this year. Here again, they have uh, revenues of $481,000 and expenditures of $400,000. There is an amount, we have $35,000 set aside to carry over into next year's uh, budget for food for the uh, community services. Most of their revenues, I'd say probably all of their revenues are in to date. So you will be seeing that, uh, that expenditure growing and the revenues I think have leveled off or maxed out. Uh, the enrollment report on page 86 is basically the same count as last month, 1576, with a shift in the uh, few of the levels. How many kindergartens are registered for next year? All right. 120. 120 right now. Thank you. Compared to 141 this year. And the last uh, three or four pages is basically uh, highlighting our energy accounts as far as the uh, fuel off for the build buildings. Here again, I used a, a uh, 155,000 gallons is allowing us to purchase like 8,500 gallons for the month of June. Uh, talking to Charlie and, and Gary today, the high school will be needing a tanker full or 60 some, 6,700 gallons. The high, the uh, middle school. Long Cove unit, uh, 2,000 gallon stop, so I don't think we'll be getting any in that, uh, that, that school, but we will be topping off or filling up the tanks at the uh, high school. Uh, with that in mind, we will have a, a balance in the fuel accounts of 36, 27, 50 roughly. As compared to, we were projecting some like fifteen, twenty thousand uh, dollars $20,000 in the red back the last September when the prices were going crazy on us. Well, also look at, and thank you for correcting the degree days, incidentally. Yes. Uh, I think it's it gives a us difference. a much more realistic wow. picture, but when you look at 7,100 uh, degree days for the previous year and uh, 6,100 for this year, and I think the average for the last decade or so is something like 7,800 or 7,400. I don't know um, what it is, but I could probably get it. We got very lucky on, on the temperature. So uh, had we, uh, we had a thousand more degree days, I'll bet we would have run at quite a deficit, wouldn't we? The buses, the transportation fuel costs are pretty, pretty evil, or, uh, even or leveled off from uh, last year. We could experience a, 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 a uh, shortfall of $26,000 to $3,000 in that account. And the last page being uh, the, uh, the log for the electricity, to date we have uh, used almost 70,000 kilowatt hours less than last year. However, we have experienced a, a, an increase in cost of $8,500. So I guess all in all, the energy management system is probably starting to do what it has to do, but it will take us 
probably another year for us. We'll have hopefully two to three years history behind us after this year so we can look and compare. The system presently has given us a printout of every, every 15 minutes as to when the demand uh, or when the peak uh, hits uh, the meters. We are in the process where they are adapting the meters so we will have the uh, reading at the Pond Cove uh, Middle School separate from, I'm sorry, the middle school separate from the high school. Uh, so I believe that by September everything should be online and uh, we should be able to, to look at this and hopefully set some parameters where we can start shedding uh, some of the power and uh, saving some money. Do you have any kind of schedule in mind for reporting to the board on how this energy savings plan is working? Sure. I mean, we could do this. Uh, see, this time of year, it's, it's tough because we're not using that much energy. Uh, I would like to do something as we get going, probably starting September, October next year on a monthly basis. And hopefully compared like this present year with the year before and, and the, the current year, which would be 91, 92. If that be an indicator, I think it will be. I mean, we should have something to, to, uh, to gear ourselves for uh, the budget process or other things. We're also in the process next fall uh, are in looking to the high school. The high school is an all-electric kitchen. We're looking to converting some of the, uh, the uh, stoves or the ranges over there. I don't know what's going to happen to that, but we're going to do a study on that. Because right now what's happening, it's like at 9.35 to 9, 9.30 to 9.45 every morning is when we start, we're peaking. And we, for some reason, tend to believe it's because of the kitchen at the high school. Hopefully we can monitor that even finer with the system that we got and identify certain areas. Yes, Rose. Thank you. Madam Chairman, um, D, I have a question regarding the consumption of the um, electricity at the middle school. <coughs> Do you have any idea what portion of that is due to construction as opposed to usage by the students? The for the asbestos removal and everything they use power from. I wouldn't have any idea. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, dear. Thank you. Next is our comments by our middle school and high school representatives. Would the middle school representatives please come forward? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Rachel Walls, and this is Lynn Powers, and she'll be presenting with me tonight. Um, last week the orientations were held for the incoming grades of 6 and 7 and the students were notified of who they would have next year as part of the middle school philosophy. Um, the current 8th grade will have step up day on Thursday when they go to the high school and beach day for middle school is Friday. The 6th and 7th graders go to Scarborough and 8th graders go to Old Orchard Beach. Okay. And all the grades will have an assembly that will be held on Monday. And all the members of the school board are welcome to attend, and um, parents are welcome to attend also. And as, mi as middle school students, we would like to wish good luck to all the teachers and staff who will be leaving the middle school. And I'd like to say that I've enjoyed the opportunity to speak to you every month um, very much, and I think it's a really good idea and that you should allow it um, for next year's people. Um, I think they'd have a really good time doing it. And I'd really just like to thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'd like to also thank you for all the people um, who came with me and don't have the opportunity to tell you what a good time they had, too. Thank you. We, we have truly enjoyed having you come and speak to us. And um, I'm sure I speak for the other board members. It's certainly something we would want to continue doing next year. Thank you very much. The orientations I heard so many wonderful things about. Thank you to the middle school for allowing the parents to have the opportunity to, and the students to have some of the jitters about the next year taken away now. I really, um, as a parent, I appreciated that and I heard from many others as well. Uh, high school representatives. Good evening. 
I first want to apologize for our absence at the May meeting. We were both out of town. Um, and I want to congratulate the new members and wish them good luck this, this coming year. And to mention Courtney Menden, who will be replacing me next year as the high school uh, school board representative. She'll be filling in and helping Laurie out. And I also want to thank you for, for the opportunity of getting up and, like Rachel said, speaking to you every month. I've enjoyed it. And I've enjoyed your openness and, and just your listening. I, I've really felt that I could, I could say just about anything up here. Um, the senior awards assembly will be held Thursday at 1.30, and the public is welcome to attend. Scholarships will be given out, as well as academic awards. And this, the varsity sports awards uh, ceremony was last night at the high school, and that was the chance for all litter winners to uh, pick up their awards, as well as other awards given out by coaches. The senior banquet will be held Wednesday night at Keeley the Caterers. Um, we'll, we'll be having a slideshow and, uh, to sort of wrap up the year. And the senior class trip, which was held last Thursday, was a great success. We went down the Soccer River, and it was, it was a great day. We had to postpone it from Tuesday, but everyone seemed to have a great time. On Monday, June 3rd, the Evening of Excellence was held at the high school um, at the cafeteria at 7 o'clock, and it was a chance to recognize the students that had made the honor roll several, several quarters of the year, and also to induct new members into the National Honor and Maroon Medal Societies. For underclassmen, finals will be beginning tomorrow. Senior finals began last Friday, and they will be ending tomorrow. And for underclassmen, there will be two finals a day, ending on Monday. And finally, graduation will be held on Friday at Fort Williams at 2 p.m., and we all look forward to seeing you there. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chairman. Yeah. I want to thank both Jennifer and, and Lori. I want to thank Jennifer for the last two years and as a board, wish her well as she goes on to higher education in the fall. Thank you. Okay. Uh, our next item is communications. Dr. Colvin? Yes, I have uh, received one item um, since I put the agenda together. Most of what I received, I think I have incorporated into the agenda one way or the other. This is a letter addressed to the outgoing chairs, uh, both the council and the school board. Um, so to uh, Phyllis Cogshall and Peter Leslie, and I'll hand over to the new chair, the copy. Um, it's from Jeff White, the chair of the school space committee um, that Charlie Greer, myself, both serve on. Oh, yeah. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> the parent the board, now, now board member. That's, that's right. I apologize. <laughs> um, the, uh, the gist of the letter is to request both the town council and the school board to allow the committee to um, delay or actually to request an extension of the time by which the committee's final report is due from July 1, 1991 to October 15th. 1991. The request is made to permit sufficient time for the retention of architectural engineering consultants to review the middle school Pine Cove elementary buildings and report to the committee on their findings and recommendations. Uh, since you've been kept uh, uh, apprised of how that committee is going uh, and uh, incidentally we are in the process of um, interviewing, uh, I think that is a, uh, a very necessary request. Um, I would not see it as an action item. I think that uh, I can, since we have a meeting tomorrow, I can pass along what I would assume to be your consensus that that's all right. Um, if anybody wants to comment on that or <coughs> ask any questions. Or, and we can assume that we have your blessing to continue with what we're doing, but uh, the report will then be uh, delivered on or before October 15th. Very good. Thank you. And that uh, is my communication. Okay, Rosemary, do you want to speak? Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. This is a verbal communication as opposed to a written, and it's from me as opposed to from a constituent. Um, I am uh, would like to bring to the attention of the public that LD66 uh, is a bill before the legislature and at 4.30 today was considered unfinished business on the Senate it is uh, a bill that would allow for a constitutional amendment requiring that the, pay the state pass no unfunded mandates. Uh, 
What has happened in the past is when a mandate without funding was passed, the municipalities would have to pay for that, uh, generally by an increase in the property tax or a reduction in a current service. Um, I do ask that if there are any members of the uh, public who are listening who have an opinion one way or the other, if they could contact Senator Gill and Representative Simons, who will be addressing the issue tomorrow. The legislature is working very hard right now to wrap up all the LDs so, so they can get to the bigger task of the budget deficit and the uh, budget for the biennium. Um, I would ask uh, you to look at channel 38, the phone numbers, their toll-free numbers are listed right there and you could please give them uh, your opinion on whether or not you would like to have unfunded uh, mandates and a constitutional amendment on the ballot uh, so that you can choose whether or not to vote for it or against it. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention, Rosemary. Okay, next is the superintendent's report. Okay, thank you. I'll start with uh, several items of good news and some general observations. I would like to um, both thank uh, Mr. Ray and comment on the fact that I think it is uh, uh, truly good news when the chair of the high school social studies department teacher in that department uh, encourages his students to regularly take part in civic meetings in their town. I, I think that that's um, both an important issue. I, I hope that you students have gotten something out of your many hours um, here and personally speaking, and I, I think probably I speak for the board, we are all delighted that you take this interest. We'd be happy to answer questions at some point, but I really wanted to congratulate both teacher and students for taking the time to do that. Uh, another item um, that was uh, mentioned in our public forum recently, uh, Peter Leslie has been appointed as one of two members from the state of Maine and one of nine members throughout the United States to a national commission on the responsibilities for post-secondary education. And I know because I ha heard some of the discussion about this, I understand that is mainly a financial advisory position that is looking for money and uh, I don't know if any of the students sitting right here are, uh, would be interested in talking to you about the possibilities but um, it is certainly in the broad sense, a conceptual sense, what should this society be concerned about as far as opportunities for funding for post-secondary education. Um, we're certainly pleased to have a uh, representative from Cape Elizabeth as one of two from the state of Maine and nine uh, nationally. The, um, this, by the way, this committee will be reporting directly to the President and the Congress in February of 1993 and also will be holding hearings around the United States. I have a few items from the school buildings on uh, items of interest that have been going on. An eight-week reading incentive program for grades K through 3 at Pond Cove culminated on May 31st with an assembly honoring the children and presenting donations of breakfast foods to Portland's homeless through the Preble Street Resource Center. The center is a social service agency that provides a breakfast program and housing assistance to homeless and low-income people in the greater Portland area. At the assembly on Friday, Julie Johnson, representing the center, accepted the generous donations. The children were then treated to a rousing performance of The Ugly Duckling, composed and performed by Louis Philippe, a local artist who has recorded an album, Street Pizza, which benefits the center. Another item, congratulations to Nina Hendrickson and Jamie O'Quinn, fifth grade students who will be honored for their crime prevention and civic responsibility efforts at the sixth annual Citizen Crime Watch Awards presentation on June 13th at Portland City Hall. Both girls responded quickly and responsibly in alerting police to an unusual situation. And finally, Ponco says we're celebrating. When we asked for support for instruction at kindergarten, the response was overwhelming. Over 50 volunteers worked with our students during the past school year. In thanks and appreciation, they sponsored a recognition tea on Tuesday, June 11th. I might also note that this afternoon, K through five crowded into uh, the uh, middle school gym uh, and honored uh, Barbara Powers, their stepping over principal, stepping over to the classroom. Um, it was delightful. The children presented uh, original poetry artifacts of various kinds, um, and um, were, by the way, a really attentive audience. I thought they were deserve a compliment. I have two other items. 
uh, received a copy of uh, awards made to two high school students representing third place award for boys in the Spear Speaking Contest that went to Ryan McFall and to Kendall Wyman uh, representing third place award for girls in the Spear Speaking Contest. And finally, I would like to echo um, what Chairman Solon said in her opening remarks. Um, we are not a perfect school system, and in many respects, we have been through a top year. Um, and I recognize, because many people do let me know, when things don't go well, that we have a variety of items that uh, perhaps are not at the top of the list of good news. But I want to take the opportunity as the school year finishes to thank all the teachers, all the students, all the parents for the many positive things that are going on in our schools. And although we sometimes get bogged down and distracted by the issues that we um, do in fact want to work on and know our problems, um, I want to point out that one of the nice things about school is that it is an enterprise that does have an ending, a hiatus, and a new beginning. And we all look forward to the new beginning, particularly at this time of year. So congratulations to all our graduates. Um, we'll be looking forward to a, I hope, a sunny, non-lightning uh, storm afternoon. I don't know what we do in the, I guess we plan it in advance, having been through these things before without their graduations. The latest weather I saw, I said it was going to be um, very pleasant, sunny, dry, uh, beautiful weather for graduation, and I certainly hope so. Thank you. Um, shall I keep on going? Mm -hmm. Please. I, I will share with the uh, group in the, uh, in the room, um, one of my phobias, and I have a few, is lightning. <laughs> so if I all of a sudden jump, <laughs> please understand, I'm truly not uh, particularly alarmed, but um, many years ago I worked as a telephone operator in the old days when they had very heavy equipment, more so than what you're wearing. And they always told us to unplug during a lightning storm, so <laughs> perhaps it's where I get it. Well, anyway. Connie, I thought uh, all superintendents were professional lightning rods. No, yeah, oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I just don't want to be literally a lightning rod. <laughs> the, uh, so I'll be a little bit distant from that. Um, last night we did hold our orientation meeting uh, and I felt that it was very positive um, and the only reason I wanted to recap it tonight was to uh, comment that uh, uh, this is a new beginning for the school board to go from five to seven members does uh, bring into play the issue of subcommittees we have had some discussion about policy policy re review of our policy manual uh, some of these issues are still at the embryonic stage and will not be part of our regular agenda until they reach a point where we can report on them, but I really feel we made a good beginning. And speaking of policy, um, I do want to point out that uh, I am very aware of the fact that we have not really completed, obviously have not completed, the K-12 through substance abuse policy uh, process um, in the um, Actually, there are a couple of good reasons for that, but I don't think uh, I need to really explain them in detail. Uh, we have a goal of having that policy in place for the start of school next year. We will be reviewing it um, through our policy subcommittee process as well as a second reading from the whole board. I was waiting for some um, legal review of the uh, policy that we had a first reading on. I have now received that. And in addition, I have received some, um, some updated material from the state that includes exactly those items that the state policy requires, which is how we get started on reviewing that policy in the first place. Uh, so that will be one of my goals this summer, to make sure that that is reviewed and in place. Any questions on that? Moving on, we have two reports this, this evening from uh, staff members. The first one will be from Lyle Kramer on the update or summary on the fourth grade assessment scores. And the second one will be from Barbara Powers on the USM Partnership Center assessment grants. We might start with the fourth grade assessment scores. Uh, thank you and good evening. The report that I sent to you for tonight's meeting is about three pages longer than most of these reports have been in the past, and that's for two reasons. Um, number one, 
quite often the question arises how come the individual student scores that are mailed home are so much different than the scale scores that I see in the reports. And what I've tried to do is include in this report a supplement on the back with a little bit of explanation at the beginning of the report to explain how those two relate to each other. Um, the other thing is this year instead of printing all the scores on one page in the report that we receive, we receive 12 pages with the scores spread out and I have tried to pull those scores together for you in, in a table form so that uh, you can make your own comparisons. Also, I did prepare a, a brief summary fact sheet that is on the table in the back of the room so if any of the people in the audience want to follow along with the presentation of the actual scores, um, anyone can pick up a, uh, a fact sheet up there. Um, first of all, I guess I would not go through this little explanation that I made about the similarities between percentile scores or the relationship between percentile scores and scale scores, but if anyone has any question about that explanation, I'd be happy to try to respond to that. Any questions? Good. Uh, let's move right on to uh, the report then. Um, I pointed out that this year we had three students, or two percent of our student population in grade four that were excluded for the from the testing because of significant handicapping conditions, and that is equal to the percentage across the state. Uh, the one unusual factor about this particular grade level, in grade four, we have 24, 28 students who have an identified handicapping condition, and that represents 18% compared to 7% across the state. Another interesting factor is that of all of our handicapped students, we tested 90% of our handicapped students, whereas the state as a whole tests 58% of the handicapped students. That's all represented in the chart on page two of the state report that I sent along to you. Um, moving along to the scale scores, I think that instead of going through the report page by page, you might want to just focus on the chart that I presented that represents the 1990-91 scores. I'll read those for you in reading. The score was 295, writing 290, math 345, science 330, social studies 320, humanities 330, and that's on a scale of 100. 400. Um, of those subscores, four increased while two decreased. And if you take the total sum of the increases, it's 95 points, while the total sum of the decreases is 30 points. The one area that seems to be going down the most is, is reading. And the following chart on page two uh, breaks down the, the non-handicapped kids' scores and compares them to the handicapped student scores for the past three years. And you can see in the reading area, for instance, that the reading scores of our non-handicapped students for the past three years is very constant. But the decline appears to take place in the area of the uh, total scores for the handicapped students. In writing, uh, there is much more variability, but it remains more constant. Math is quite constant. Sciences, social studies, and humanities, they each have their ups and downs, depending upon the particular year. The other interesting pattern is that Although our handicapped students have a score of 100 in reading, many of the scores in the other subtests 
uh, pretty strong. It's interesting to note, too, that, this, that there's a similar pattern. If you go to your report that the state puts out, you'll notice that uh, across the state, there's a similar pattern. Um, each year, I report on the gender gap. And this year, as I mentioned, if there's a gender gap, it's pretty much a difference that favors the girls for the most part. Uh, some of the traditional subject areas where boys have scored higher, in math, for instance, the girls actually outscore the boys in math. While on the surface that looks very positive, I might point out too that uh, one, of the, one of the interesting factors about this class is the handicap, large handicap population. Uh, we have also a large percentage of boys, and I suspect that I haven't done a count, but I suspect that many of the handicapped students are probably, there are probably more boys there than girls, which might account for the boys not doing quite as well as they oftentimes do. Um, I won't bother to read the, uh, the gender differences there, but those are there for you. Uh, here we that? Well, I, I noticed that in the numbers that you provided for the board, you go back through 1988. I'm curious as to how these reflect scores back through 1986. And in taking that more uh, comprehensive view of these test scores, which of these areas are statistically significant in their changes from year to year and as a trend over the past uh, five the years? that you see here in reading is, is the pattern that goes back through the, the first years of the testing. And uh, there's been a constant pattern there of decline. Um, a significant score is a score of 50 points. Now, that's one standard deviation and is generally considered a, a significant change from, from one group of scores to another. In most cases, you won't see that much of a decline in one year, but if you put a couple of years together, and you see a significant difference. Could you do that in the future, get us a list of all the scores from the time of their inception? Sure. I think that would be nice to, to be able to see from the beginning of the scoring. In reference to the reading, um, how do we compare statewide as far as the type of curriculum? Supposedly the MEA's address is more attuned to the way we are, are teaching in the state. And I wonder how we compare with the rest of the state as far as the type of, of reading program we have, since we seem to be declining since the MEA's came into being. Well, if I think Our decline, certainly for the, for the last three years, our decline in reading scores takes place in, in what, with one specific group of students. If you look at the non-handicapped group, you will notice that it's been very consistent over the past three years, staying just about even. And many of those students won't be in the regular curriculum, in the, re in the regular reading curriculum. So, I think to, to look at the question of does our reading curriculum uh, compare to that acro those across the state, I think that's an interesting question and I would defer to some of our reading specialists. But I don't think that we can draw the conclusion from looking at these figures that our non-handicapped population has, has been declining in the past three years. It's been very constant. So do you feel the number of handicapped students has increased over the, the past six year period? It hasn't necessarily increased. It's gone, the percent I think has gone up and down. And this particular grade has a, a very significant greater percentage of students with real learning problems. Not only do they have more, but many of the students that I work with have a real significant handicapping condition. Is, is the definition of a handicapped student or special needs student a statewide description that is consistent from district to district 
and if it is, is there any uh, idea why this particular year has such a large contingent from Cape Elizabeth? All right. Again, with the identification, I'd like to defer to our director of special ed, but my view is that there the are federal and state guidelines that are very that are very consistent and have to be followed through very thoroughly. But Wayne, would you want to say? So we answer that <clears throat> question, Mark, about the standardization of definition. Both federal and state law defines what a handicapped child is in nine in the state and 11 handicapping conditions in the federal law. So one could say, yes, there's a standard definition of what a handicapping condition is, for example, for a child who is behaviorally disordered or learning disabled. However, every system uh, uses different tests to evaluate a youngster. There's a certain level of interpretation in some of those disorders. And at its most uh, um, distorted, if you will, assessment practice, you can in fact have a child in one district identified as handicapped and yet not in another. So it isn't as easy as yes as a standard definition because it does lend itself to some interpretation because of the imperfectness mm -hmm. of defining what a handicap is. Not all that easy. Mm -hmm. Peter? Is it fair to <coughs> conclude if you look, for example, just at the reading scores, uh, which in uh, 89 or 191 and they go to 158 and then to this year to 100, that's almost two standard deviations. Uh, you could certainly conclude that we weren't classify more people as a handicap than than are really handicapped because that group has uh, declined so rapidly in its results. In fact, it's right at the bottom. It's at the bottom of the scale and yet it's a larger group. It would be impossible to conclude that we are including people in the handicapped uh, definition who are not handicapped by some other measure. Is that correct? Was that too confusing? <laughs> well, I, I'm not sure if your question is, are we identifying children who are not handicapped or not, Peter? So if that's the question, then I can respond to that. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to see if by looking at these numbers, my conclusion is that we are clearly not uh, identifying children as handicapped who might not be identified as oh, handicapped in some other clear. district. That's very clear. In fact, okay. Two years ago, when we were reviewed by the state, uh, we talked about that quite a bit with that review team. And we had to, to uh, assure them, as well as show them in practice, uh, how we weren't, in fact, identifying children who are not handicapped. And uh, even since that assurance, we have met as a team repeatedly to address that very issue. Uh, these kids uh, in this particular class uh, came to us with a fairly significant number of language disabilities. It's a little unusual to have that large a number. Uh, also, uh, what this doesn't say, and I'd like the board to know a little bit about, and perhaps we could do something more later with the board in terms of all of this, because it's fairly significant, is, as you may know, Every child identified as handicapped has an individual education plan. It's what we call the IEP. That plan is put together by a team of people, including the parents. That plan is reviewed annually for progress. If our people and the, all of the parents feel that progress has stopped or, the, or that there's something unusual going on in the lack of progress, we respond to that pretty expeditiously. We may, in fact, seek out further evaluation by our own people. We may seek out evaluation by a pediatrician, a neurologist, occasionally a psychiatrist, uh, any number of consultants to ask the questions about what's happening here where these children aren't progressing. What you don't see, of course, as board members is the annual reviews of each of those child's IEPs where we, in fact, do look at the issue of progress in the goals set each year for those children. And those goals are evaluated twice a year 
and we discuss them with the parents at least twice a year. This data won't show that process. It's much more individualistic and it responds to the issue of progress and achievement very closely, much differently than this does. So why do you think that the scores this year are lower than they've ever been for handicapped students? Is the answer they're more handicapped? That's one answer, Loretta, but I, I want to st stress that we, uh, this data is relatively new to me. Lyle and I haven't, I don't think we've discussed this beyond 90 seconds at this point. I need to sit with him and look at some item analysis. We, I need to, to take a look more at the structure of that testing. For example, some of our kids with learning disabilities in the area of language have trouble with the word of in a math problem, for example or they don't understand a direction that says, now we'd like you to write a response for reading an article. Another thing is children um, up to probably the fourth or fifth grade don't have a lot of experience with multiple choice questions in exams. But they've always taken the test in years past and, and the scores have not been as extremely low as they were this year. Mm -hmm. Why? That, that, that doesn't seem to differentiate this year from any other year. That in and of itself doesn't, Loretta. I, I think one of the things is that, that this class, and, and you will remember from about four years ago, we had a similar discussion. Um, that we had a, a larger group of children who had more serious language disabilities, and it showed up in our evaluations. Very frankly, I am much more um, concerned at the eighth grade level and that uh, group of children, we had quite a rise in their evaluations. So I felt better about that. I'm naturally concerned about this, but at this point, I don't have enough analysis to respond to it in terms of the technicalities involved here. I would guess that you simply don't have enough numbers <coughs> to answer that type of question. And to uh, just give you an example, if you were doing a public opinion poll of, uh, let's say, about four or five simple questions, you would have to poll six, seven hundred probably to get within a two or three percent error. Uh, you have many more variables here. I would think you'd need a population in the thousands. Uh, I don't know whether it's two thousand or ten thousand. I'm not an expert on educational statistics. Not yet, anyway. <laughs> I may be no more in a year. Uh, but I, I, wouldn't you suspect that you needed more numbers to, uh, than these? Oh, yes. For statistical purposes, I do. But again, we look at the, the kids individually. And we meet with the parents about these issues of achievement, too. Not e there are no easy answers to this. There, there are certainly ones we're about to pursue. Do we have a higher percentage of our students who are handicapped that take the MEA over the state? Or yes. is that mandated that all students take other than those? Well, it's required that as many as a system and or local policy determines will take it. We take a higher percentage so, because I want that as part of the data for where are the kids in the uh, curriculum as uh, sought out in, in this test. But it's considerably higher than many other places. What is our percentage of general popul <coughs> the general population versus the state that are... I'm just talking system-wide. That are identified as handicapped. Are, identified. are we high or we're just about We're the just average. about the same. It's about 12% statewide. We're about 11.6, I think, something like that. 11, 8, something like that. That's always a concern for the taxpayer that we seem to attract, and I, I want to clarify that. Yeah. And, and incidentally, you, you may remember this, Charlie. Last year when we were doing budgeting, that was an issue we talked about. I did a 10-year study. We averaged 181 children across that 10 years, uh, and this year uh, in our official count, if you will, to the federal government, it's 189. Other questions? Yeah. Um, all right, yeah, if, if you want to, um, would you come up to the podium, please, and, and uh, give us your name? In the class, in the class of 1988-1989, um, that fourth grade class, 
and I think you might want to check this, but I'm quite sure it was 33% um, in special ed. And I remember it was um, quite shocking at that time when we were all talking about it. And that class still scored significantly higher. Um, that class also had 28% retention, as I remember it. But I think the school board might want to look into that, okay? Um, the other thing is, maybe these scores are low because of um, handicapped children, but maybe they're not. So I think we need to look very carefully at this, because if they're low, because in fact the children aren't being taught as well as they need to be, um, that's another thought. Okay, if it is because of special ed, okay, but let's make really sure before we excuse the low scores. Thank you. Yeah, I think my comments uh, earlier were, were, were in relation only to the handicapped. Uh, and I think that we probably can conclude something from the non-handicapped uh, results, couldn't we? Yes, the, uh, the minimum standard, you mentioned the number in a sample to, to uh, do any kind of statistical grouping or analysis with them. And the minimum standard is 100. And we have that number of students in the non-handicapped grouping. But in the handicapped grouping, as you say, we're talking about a high of 28 and probably as low as 14 or 15. And when you put that on a, on a curve and develop your own st set of statistics for that very small number of students, uh, your scores go way up and way down very quickly. That's one of the reasons that you, that in some of this testing, you will notice some very small communities that have terribly high scores and some very small communities have very low scores, and that's because one or two students in a group of 10 or 12 students can vary a score dramatically if you don't have that at minimum of 100 from which to develop a norm and a score. Was there any item analysis done as far as the reading? Um, was there a particular area that uh, the students had a problem with? If you look at the reading results and you look to page six, you will notice that there's a skill area grouping. I'm talking about the report that was mailed to you, the particular state report that was mailed to you. What page are you referring to again? Page six. Oh. They are relatively consistent. In the, uh, in the introductory part of the report, of the state report, where it talks about subscores. And here again, the bar here, keep in mind that a bar in this section of the skill area, the bar represents the significant score, not the expected score band that you see in the graph at the top of the page. And in that, explanation of scores, it says that if any of those bars overlap at all, that would be considered as a common score or a similar score. So there are two, there are two, two scores there that just barely become a different score. So, so the uh, skill areas, the, the subtest areas in the areas of reading are quite consistent. Where do we go with this from here? What, what now do you do with this information? How do you apply it to these children? What do we learn from it? Well, number one, the teachers have all received this information in a workshop setting. Uh, percentile scores in the areas of reading, math, and writing have gone home to parents, and then all of the curriculum people usually look at this in terms of what it might mean to their particular curriculum area if that if their particular area is measured is, is part of the testing and depending upon what issue comes up we do an in-depth analysis like i don't know mike Reffin, as you recall from last mm -hmm. year 
had some concerns about gender, and every item was examined extensively, every item on the math test. Um, this year, I suspect that the, the group of handicapped students will receive close scrutiny as a result of the testing. So, so we do quite a bit with the scores in general, and then as specific areas uh, indicate some concern or interest, that receives extensive analysis usually. I'm wondering if some point in the fall we might have a some kind of report back from you or one of the principals or somebody, you know, specifically saying, okay, we looked at the short passages, that seemed to be a problem. Here's what we're doing to um, help our students in the classroom. Um, maybe uh, you know a few more uh, definite kinds of things that so that we can see come from um, these tests. We usually we've done it I think for the past two or three years in workshop setting, usually in the fall, and we could look at the SRA tests mm -hmm. if you want to, in addition to this test. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you, Lyle. One of the issues that is a national concern is what tests to use, how to improve on tests, and how to make better use of those tests that we do give. Uh, an example of the uh, local area's uh, attempt to become better at assessment is uh, going on through the USM partnership. We've mentioned that uh, effort from time to time, and uh, one of their fairly recent um, within the last couple of years, recent efforts has been to set up a center for assessment to help those school districts that are part of the partnership to, uh, to have uh, close connections with the university's research people, uh, those people who are used to not only giving tests but analyzing them, the statistical data, how do we read them, and what are they really telling us. In addition, there is a national effort to get better at what is known as authentic assessment, which simply is a rather um, buzzword way of talking about helping teachers, uh, and I would say parents, uh, become more adept at watching what children are doing and understanding the clues that they give us as to what uh, they are in fact learning from material. The, the difficulty with standardized testing, and I sometimes think that what might be helpful is to have seminars with parents and school board members and. Uh, teachers um, and uh, actually I mean I, th I think it might be interesting if some of us sat down and took the fourth grade reading test. Um, one of the things you will discover when you do that is that you are, uh, I'm speaking for myself and I can get very high scores in a lot of standardized tests. Uh, I don't necessarily get all of those questions right and the reason I don't get them all right is that I start reading into the question interpretations uh, which is a problem with standardized tests. It's sort of snippets of material and snippets of this, that, and the other. And uh, frankly, United States is often criticized for not giving longer, more essay-type tests, more connected uh, issues. And uh, the effort to give performance-based tests where a youngster simply can't, uh, and I, had, I have known some youngsters, and I've also known uh, graduate students who became very good at psyching out the test not necessarily knowing the material well, but knowing how tests are apt to be set up and making and being good guessers. So in an effort to deal with some of those issues, we are, um, as a country, really gearing up to look at a variety of alternative testing. Um, through the USM Partnership Center Assessment, they're encouraging us to get better at that, and we have four grants that Barbara Powers <coughs> is going to explain to you tonight that our staff has been awarded as, um, part of that effort. I uh, would like to point out that the grants were assigned uh, on a competitive basis to teachers who got uh, together in, in some cases as a group or in some cases singly, wrote the grants. Um, and I think you have a sheet that summarizes that uh, out of the seven, I think it's 17 districts, received 31 proposals requesting a total of 125,000. 
team of school and university faculty completed review of the proposals and awarded the 60,000 pool of funds available to 17 projects. The fact that Cape Elizabeth has received four of those 17 projects, I would say, speaks very well for our staff, and I applaud them for taking the effort, and I look forward to seeing what happens. And I think Barbara wants to explain some of those to you. You do have a summary sheet giving you some details. Thanks, Connie. Um, I would also add that it was a it was a real nice confirmation for us to be awarded those grants. It ended up totaling about um, a quarter of all funds that were distributed throughout the partnership uh, came directly to our school, and it was a nice vote of confidence both from the university and from the other teacher readers involved in awarding the grants. Assessment it all is always of uh, enormous concern to us, is both through the standardized testing that we're participating in and also through what the partnership is choosing to call authentic student assessment, getting real close to a, a true picture of student understanding across a variety of curriculum areas. And this process started in the spring with the partnership alerting us that the funding would be available, hosting then an assessment exchange conference where many of us came together and shared things we'd been doing in our schools with each other to sort of get seed ideas. Um, a full explanation of the grant writing process and then about a 10-day deadline to get them turned in. Now I will say that the writing was not uh, quite as lengthy and involved as that involved in state innovative grant writing, but it was still very involved. And it, in the springtime of the year, it's very busy. And part of what I wanted to do to share with you tonight is not only you have overviews of the grants, but also to especially publicly thank the teachers who took the time to meet with me, to meet with other curriculum leaders, to scope out all of the brainstorms they'd been having about areas of assessment they'd like to pursue, and then got together often over weekends and wrote these under enormous deadline. We had editing conferences, we finally had final submission, we hand delivered the grants right under the wire, and we're re really delighted that these efforts paid off. So if I could acknowledge that for you, under the alternative assessments in math that we hope to get started this summer, Michael Efron mm -hmm. did the writing. He also spent quite a bit of time speaking with Gary Record and also fourth grade teacher Carolyn Sloan about the possible components of this grant. Um, we hope to really be um, developing assessment packages for more than one focus area this summer. Michael spoke to one. I'd like to think that we come uh, up with geometry and computation, if not another, depending on how much time we can squeeze uh, in this summer. So delighted for the chance to, and that's a full K-8 project, our largest project. The curriculum-based assessment for reading writing connection was written by Sue Welch. She spent a lot of time talking it through with Nancy Hutton as well. We're delighted to go back and look at our results of the Psychological Corporation work we did this year under reading writing connections uh, and to find the strong points of that testing program and elaborate upon them and get back going with that in the fall. One of the nicest things about this particular kind of assessment under reading comprehension and writing is that it's very much a part of program. It feels like uh, regular work the children are doing in their classroom. So it's not time out, let's spend three and a half days testing. And so it feels good to teachers that way that twice a year a, a writing project that they're doing in their classroom is actually something that's holistically scored and evaluated for comprehension and writing progress. So that part feels nice. It's not another layer of, of testing. The third one we were granted, Emergent Reader Assessment Procedures, was written by Ted DeMille and Lynn Evans. Ted uh, especially has done extensive graduate work in that whole uh, area of emergent literacy. And as he joins us down in our kindergarten team, really took the initiative <coughs> to pull together a program that will allow those teachers to identify uh, emerging um, identification of, of reading and to come up with strategies to work with those learners around uh, literacy. Some of you who, well, Connie especially, who did some work in kindergarten this year for us, knows how very individualized some of that needs to be for children. And this will give them common language and common strategies and be a much more precise indicator for parents also about how that very important aspect of literacy learning is happening for the children. That will be pulled together this summer as well. Finally, the other grant we were awarded was student self-assessment of writing using predetermined standards. Nancy Rollis and Nadine Record wrote this piece for us. We got very excited at the assessment conference to learn of a district who's gone the next step in holistic scoring, which is to actually have the children help with, this, with the teacher to set the standards and then to evaluate their own work 
to have predetermined standards, to write to them, and then to be able to speak articulately toward uh, the degree to which their paper successfully addressed those needs. We're very excited about that opportunity to invest the children in the assessment of their own work. I think that's a, a very logical next step for us. I'd also would like to recognize Becky Swift assisting Sue Welch in presenting a grant that, that did not get funded where we hoped to do some rewrite of our whole language guide this summer. I guess that was a little bit of a stretch to have that come under the assessment umbrella. And Andrew Lomack McNair who made an attempt to add some technology to his computer hardware in his classroom and that also uh, did not get uh, funded but he still put enormous effort in along with Becky and I thank those two teachers as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, next is the board chairman's report, and it's amazing to me that after only 24 hours as chairman, I do have one item for the board chairman's report. Um, last night in our orientation workshop, we uh, talked about committee appointments, and so I'll ask at this time, um, you've had 24 hours to, <laughs> to think it over. Uh, some of these committees are, are a real you know, time commitment and big responsibility. And is there anybody that's had second thoughts about what they volunteered to do last night? OK, then <clears throat> I will read uh, our committee appointments for the 1991-1992 school year. Our PRVTC General Advisory Board uh, appointment is Loretta Pond. Uh, negotiations, um, Peter, Ann, and Charlie. Uh, teacher Contracts Study Committee, Mark and myself. Legislative Liaison Contact Person, Rosemary. Community Team, Rosemary. <laughs> Town Center Study Committee, Loretta. And as Part of our, our uh, subcommittees that we'll be forming, um, we have a policy committee that we'll be starting with Loretta, Mark, and Ann, and they will uh, move us into what other subcommittees we need to form um, along with that one. Um, so thank you very much, and you'll be hearing from, <laughs> from me or whoever uh, as we go along. Okay, unfinished business, the flexible benefit plan. Thank you. Um, in your packet, I put a number of items, and obviously I'm not going to go through all of those, but I would be happy to answer questions. Um, I believe we need to look at a few specifics. Uh, I did include a summary of the um, cost to the district and actually I thought afterwards of a couple of reasons why it probably won't even be that much but um, you may recall that my discussion last uh, at last month's meeting when we talked about a subcategory of all other employees that is those employees who do not belong to a um, collective bargaining unit that is principally uh, we have I think eight or nine teacher assistants um, the supervisors of maintenance transportation and food service um, our secretarial staff in the central office, the superintendent, and the business manager. And because those form a non-collective bargaining unit, we had to make some adjustments to put bring everybody in line with our basic uh, flexible benefits plan, the uh, full plan of which you adopted last month. Uh, the major adjustment in that, you may recall, was that uh, we had to make the same benefits accessible to everybody in that group, and uh, since some had dental and some did not, your choices were either to take it away from everybody or to extend it to the, to the people in that group that didn't have it. And you chose as part of that vote to extend it. In the, and I did include a chart to give you what that amounts to in a dollar figure and the total cost, uh, which, by the way, for the listening public is uh, about $3,488. The uh, other issue, I think, in summarizing is that this particular flexible benefits plan is really a salary reduction plan, which I explained last month. And it does mean that nobody in the district can receive cash in lieu of benefits. Um, that is an issue uh, that was raised. For instance, there was some concern about the language in our plan, whether that actually made any of that possible. And I have included the attorney's letter explaining exactly what that meant. But not only does it 
not make it possible, the plan itself makes it impossible for anybody to receive cash in lieu, uh, which means that those employees, principally central office and administrative employees who have been receiving that cash in lieu, and uh, by the way, since last fall, that has all been reported and, and uh, as taxable income. So that's not a problem. That's not the issue we're talking about. It is simply a feature of this flexible benefits plan. It's a salary reduction plan, and so that cannot be um, a practice that continues. And I've made some suggestions as to how we will handle that. Uh, and I don't think that um, uh, since there's, there's no difference in cost to the district, I don't see any particular need for you to vote on those suggestions as I have made them. Um, if you have any questions uh, on any of this, I'd be happy to answer it. Trust me. Thank you. Um, Connie, the question I had, when this amount uh, of money, which is roughly $35,000, is added to income, um, do we also have an additional cost for the statutory benefits of uh, FICA, FUTA, uh, workers' comp insurance? Uh, the, well, all of these, let's see now, most of these people are under teacher retirement. I'm looking at the list in front of me. Some are on Social Security, so they, uh, depending on which they would have. Now, obviously, if it is a, for instance, the administrative staff uh, is covered by teacher retirement, which does not carry a local um, match, that's a state match, so that uh, there is a retirement piece that is taken out of the uh, employee, but not out of municipal costs. On the other hand, those districts, I mean, those employees that are under Social Security uh, or FICA, that is, in fact, a municipal cost. So that is an addition. And I lost track of the others. Workers' comp, unemployment? That is a general um, cost. Unemployment up to the first 7000 for a year. Mm -hmm. Right. And the insurance benefits are based on a level amount? The administrators have been enjoying a um, small insurance benefit. Again, what we need to keep in mind as far as that administrative group, they are going into collective bargaining. All of those costs will be reviewed as part of drawing up their master contract. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions? No, what I don't understand in your, in your recommendation concerning the administrative unit is if we approve this, um, what are we approving of that? Are we approving just what their salaries are or are we approving everything else that they're doing? Actually, I'm not asking anything here to be approved. What I'm explaining is that the plan, which uh, actually went into effect on January 1, uh, does not allow us to list as two different sums, income and cash in lieu for benefits. And I am uh, letting you know that we will amend any contract information we have to change. It won't be a dollar uh, change, a total dollar change. It will simply be a change in the way we list it as salary. Uh, as far as the administrators are concerned, I am basically uh, recommending that we cease giving cash in lieu to any administrator who is now receiving it, subject to whatever the outcome of um, negotiations. negotiations would be. Um, I actually, in order, to, since this is such a complicated issue, it probably would be appropriate for you to take a couple of votes here, as long as you're clear about what you're voting on. Um, I am suggesting that that is the best way to handle this. Um, and if there are any adjustments through negotiated bargaining that make some salary adjustments because of a loss of benefit that can be handled uh, when their actual contract is written retroactively. And I'm, what I was concerned about is that if you continued this benefit, uh, even, a, even listing it as an increase in salary, and then the master contract comes out with something different, we might have paid a benefit to people that in fact would have to be taken away. I wanted to avoid paying out dollars that might be uh, at some later time taken away. The other issue, however, uh, that is part of that are the people uh, primarily, I've listed them here separately, the secretaries in the central office, a very small number of people who have been receiving the cash in lieu, and their benefit level has been uh, lower than the administrative benefit level, level it has been at 2,500. Most of the 
those, uh, let's see, there's one, two, three, four people in that list plus the uh, two people who work for community services. I have uh, suggested to them that they simply rewrite their budget line, which is salary plus benefits, to ensure that the salary line includes the salary, that, that portion that was cash in lieu, and that the benefit line only includes the medical benefit. Uh, since you, the amount will not change and you've already approved it, I thought that that was probably the best way to take care of that for the time being. Um, it can be subject to adjustment if you wish. That leaves us with one, two uh, central office people, um, the uh, director of um, food services, uh, who I am recommending since their benefit level is below the 2,500, that you look at that amount and uh, add that to their total salary rather than simply take the benefit away. These are people who earn a smaller amount to begin with. Uh, that benefit has become part of their, um, their general salary expectation. You may, of course, just simply stop paying if you choose so choose. I did suggest to you, however, in the discussion that I thought the fairest thing to do was to um, maintain that level of income but with language, since I'm reviewing the personnel policies anyway, they are currently being rewritten, we could insert language indicating what the exact pay rates and benefits of each employee uh, actually is, and that any adjustment in salary according to this need to adjust uh, would be for that particular person until that person left and would be reduced at any time that that person chose to take the same amount of money in benefits. In other words, if somebody uh, chose to take the benefit or increase their coverage, um, it would be part of that agreement. I thought that was the fairest thing to do. We have one employee who is actually under a negotiated agreement uh, who, before she became part of the negotiated agreement, did in fact receive that cash in lieu. Uh, that one will have to be adjusted through an um, dealing with the association. We can't do that unilaterally. I know that's a little complicated. <laughs> In reference to um, <coughs> Rosemary's concern, I would like to know what additional costs of adding this to their, to make it a salary item versus a cash in there. Would that affect, because it is in fact b being treated as, uh, yes. as, as taxable income right now, would changing that from one column to the other affect the uh, FICA? Not necessarily. Is that off last <laughs> August, September? Mm -hmm. As in taxable. Is, is uh, part of the budget process as far as the. Uh, so look at that list, you, you've got to separate it. The main state retirement did recognize secretaries prior to 1989, uh, July. First of 89 as being part of the teacher retirement side, therefore no social security. Uh, some people, the newer secretaries coming on, do not fit into that category. Uh, I'd have to look at the funds, but since last September, it has been treated as a, as a uh, part of something. So as far as D is concerned, there's no additional cost to the system. There's certainly no additional cost to the system because, in fact, all we are talking about, these are, these, um, looking at that list that you have, benefit level below 2,500. Those are, uh, in fact, actually, as far as, I mean, really discounted for the time being the uh, community services people and the last name on the list. Those are separate issues. So we're talking really about three people, two central office, and one, um, a system-wide supervisor. Okay. Now, all of the benefits that they've been receiving have been listed as ta taxable income. So all you are, all I am really suggesting is that you, your choices are, because the plan will not allow us to give any cash in lieu. We would be taking money away from them to simply drop the cash in lieu, which strikes me as being unfair to an employee in our employee right now who's been receiving that. Uh, so your choice is to either, however, is you may drop it because they can no longer receive it. 
or you may increase their salary by that sum. It does not add anything to the cost to the district. You have set a maximum. Correct. That's I'm I'm not you know I'm looking at that level where it is now set at twenty five hundred. Because we do have a person who falls out of that category, and I don't want to say I'm proving something and that person's included. Well, this so is you have set a maximum. Right. This okay. is this list right here. Okay. Right. Okay. The other list, the administrative list. Uh, I've already made my recommendation, which um, if you wish to take a separate vote on, you may, or I might, you know, I think that it's, um, well, yes, you can make, the, uh, obviously, vote on these as two separate issues. One, to accept the uh, recommendation as to the phase in for, or the um, exact title of that, I guess, would be the adjustment for administrative cash in lieu um, will be subject to negotiations. The adjustment for the cash in lieu for the um, um, category receiving the $2,500 level or less, or less um, will be, can be handled by adjusting their salary to reflect that, but dropping the cash in lieu benefit. I would like to see two motions two more. to clarify that there's yeah. a distinction. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Any other discussion? Okay, so we are going to take two votes on this tonight. Is that right? Yes, I think that would be okay. in order. Do do I hear a motion for accepting the phase in of the um, administrative cash and lieu subject to negotiation? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? And a second motion for the category of 2,500 or less. Do I hear a motion for that? To move. Second. Thank you. All in favor? Okay. Could you repeat the motion, please? The second one. <laughs> Help me with the ending of this motion. Category of $2,500 or less, adjusting the salary. And what was the end of that? Just in the salary in that amount. In that amount. To reflect the amount of cash and lieu benefits now being given would be the precise. For those for those employees who are now in the system. Not for oh, any new yes. employee coming into I think we gotta make a distinction. I'm this is to cut yeah. this is to grandfather okay. those who are in That's the system correct. at the time. Yeah, clearly in the future we will uh, <clears throat> for certain employees set a salary, then that teacher can look at our flexible benefits plan and authorize deductions from the salary to provide those benefits. And that's the benefit. The benefit the employee gets is that then he or she has lower taxable income. But this that's motion is grandfathering those employees who are not in a bargaining unit who are presently employed. And that's the distinction I would like to make in Correct. this motion. Correct. Amy, what did you want to say? employees present in the system. Okay. We haven't voted on that. Did we? That well, I move to amend okay. the motion to include the grandfathering of existing employees that are in a non-bargaining unit. Okay, this is a motion to amend. To amend the original motion, which was just setting a limit. Okay. okay. Second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Um, appreciate your working your way through that one. This is a somewhat complicated issue. Okay. Now, in the uh, under personnel requests, uh, in your uh, agenda packet, I explained that I, in searching the board minutes, I found that the administrative contracts were generally voted on by the board when a new administrator came on board, uh, but I was not able to find uh, that they had been, in fact, voted on a yearly um, basis. However, since they are contracts that up, up to and including right now are one-year contracts, uh, it is appropriate for you to be voting, and so I included the list of uh, administrative contracts that would be uh, Richard DeFusco, High School Assistant Principal, Wayne Doerr, Director of Special Services, Nancy Hutton, Middle School Principal, Frank Miles, High School Principal, and Nancy St. John, 
Pine Cove Assistant Principal. Uh, I'm recommending them for the 1991-92 school year. As I indicated again in the agenda notes, I recognize that again going into a bargaining session uh, will carry implications not only for salary and benefits but also a variety of issues including, I'm sure, um, such things as length of contract, uh, possibly a matrix for the um, establishment of relative salary values within the system, and a number of other issues uh, including administrative evaluation process and instrument and so forth. But at the meantime, I think it is imperative that we nominate and appoint our administrators since they do go on a July 1 through June 30th school year in this district. Any comments? Okay. Uh, then I need a motion to accept the superintendent's nomination for administrative contracts for the 1991-1992 school year. So Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Let's take a vote. All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Now we have the superintendent's nomination for a new teacher for the 1991-1992 school year. All right. And uh, you had in your packet a brief <coughs> summary for Beth Ann Dixon uh, that I'm nominating as a K-5 special education teacher full-time. She is a graduate of the State University of New York. At Geneseo, graduated cum laude with a BS in education in 1986. She has five years of experience in Owego, New York as a primary special education teacher. Okay. Comments? Okay. Um, I need a uh, motion to um, accept the superintendent's nomination for Beth Ann Dixon for the 1991-1992 school year. So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. I put on the agenda adjustment to current staffing, and I think I neglected to put it in your packet, so I'll explain what we mean by that. Beth Sandmere, who has been a part-time uh, speech therapist with us, um, we, have we have decided that we have a need to expand her time to full-time. I should tell you that she will be funded through local entitlement or federal funds. Um, this is a need that has occurred, frankly, since we finished the budget process, but it will not impact the current budget. So the uh, motion would be to extend Beth Sandmere, who is already under contract from part-time to full-time as a speech therapist. She is in what part of the system? She's at the intermediate level. I'm not sure if she handles anybody at primary unit or not, but I know she's in the intermediate unit at the present time. So how many speech therapists do we have system wide? Three. Two and three quarters? Two and three quarters. Okay. This will make it three full. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. I need a motion to accept Beth Sandmere's nomination for the 1991-1992 school year. Then move. Seconded. Any further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Uh, I also uh, discovered in searching minutes that we have not necessarily given you a copy of the co-curricular appointments <coughs> year to year. These are also, as are athletic uh, appointments, one year contracts, and they should be voted on on a year to year basis. Now, obviously, at this time of year, we have not really finished all of our process. And I want to make some adjustments to the list that you have and to let you know that we will be completing that list with various appointments uh, between now and the start of the school year. Sometimes some of these appointments for activities that occur later in the year uh, may not be filled until at uh, that time, but uh, we should uh, make sure that you get all of those as part of your regular board meetings. First of all, on the page it says uh, grade reps, special ed, allied arts, and middle school instructional assistant. Under special ed team leader 4 or 5, would you please cross out the name that is there? I understand the appropriate nominee is Margaret Lewis. And on the back side of the sheet, I would ask you to put a line through 
the senior class advisor and the high school yearbook advisor, those processes are not finished yet, uh, and so it would be inappropriate to vote on those tonight. Those are the adjustments to that list, and you can take one vote for the entire list. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> any comments, questions? Madam Chairman, mm -hmm. I just need some clarification on um, co-curricular fees, um, the positions. Just mm -hmm. what is instruction music 5-8? Chorus 6 8, vocal instruction 9 12. What is that in addition to their regular duties? I need someone to explain that to me. Well, everything on this list is something that has at one time or another been negotiated with the teacher's um, bargaining unit. Uh, frankly, I don't have the history of how those particular issues uh, became carved out in that way. I certainly have had my experience with these over a period of time with different school systems. Perhaps somebody here can clarify that. Well, uh, uh, what is it different in, in in what the curriculum they're teaching? Isn't that what they're hired for? It's two different. I believe it's two different people sharing responsibility. I believe the recommended. Can I try? I think the, the additions are for uh, work that is conducted um, somewhat extensively after school hours rather than for what they do during the school day. Would that cover concerts and that kind of thing? It, or? it does cover that, but I think it, it covers more than it, not just the concerts. It, it covers um, uh, work they do with other co-curricular groups. For instance, in the high school um, last year, Joe Donatelli spent hours doing the pit band for the musical. Um, he spends time doing uh, other small groups after school that, that, that are not a part of the regular chorus or band or instrumental music curriculum. So that in his case, or in the case of his predecessor, these were negotiated positions to cover that kind of work. I guess I'd, what I really need is clarification of the middle school intermediate, what is in addition to what he's already doing. I liked Connie's answer when she said it, these were things that were long-standing and she didn't <laughs> really understand exactly what all of them were because that sort of fits my predicament right now. I, I'm really not sure, you Charlie. Know, you know what that's going to lead me to, uh, is to table those two nominations. I, I understand. Until I get um, clarification. This is something that is... And that is not because I'm against the music program because I have three children right. in instrumental music, Absolutely. but I went through this a year and a half ago mm -hmm. where I didn't quite understand and oh, abs absolutely. I, under I understand your confusion. My basic understanding of it is, is this is something that was negotiated through the Teachers Association and is part of their contract. My understanding is that in the instructional music, it is for the things that occur after the regular teaching hours or before the regular teaching hours, such as concerts, such as the early morning rehearsals. Um, you will notice in the chorus section, the 6-8, that's blank at this point um, because we are not clear about what that is. Uh, Rebecca Wing, who does our choral instruction for grades five and six, she does that during her teaching assignment. And so there is no extra um, there for her for that. I'm not sure how she is compensated for evening con concerts. Um, I don't know the answer to that other than to say my understanding was it was something that the teachers negotiated through their contract. That, that is correct, Nancy. It is a, an item that is uh, negotiated. Uh, the board also has the right not to f not to fill uh, a position at any time uh, or an appointment for a year. I guess you you could not fill it, uh, you know, or decide not to have it uh, continue in the middle of the year. Uh, we have a committee that uh, that meets and uh, decides on the amounts and uh, decides on the uh, whether or not we're going to fill it. Um, so that's what I can add to the history of of this. Uh, but to answer your specific question, Charlie, what does Mr. What does Boffa do with his time? Do? Particularly, uh, I, I don't, I'm on the athletic committee, and I do not recall who's on the co-curricular uh, committee. I don't believe they met this year. No, as a matter of fact, what I'm finding is that since you haven't been voting on it, it hasn't been something that has been clearly updated and clarified from year to year. You obviously, I mean, I'm, this is another one of those processes that I'm involving myself and you and 
uh, I can appreciate your confusion. On the other hand, I can assure you that if this is on the list that has gone through um, negotiation, which is my understanding that that is the case, although I was not there at the negotiated list, that it should have had at that time certain hours and explanations attached. I think if you are confused and you have been dealing with these in the past, then that certainly is a signal to me that we need to add this to our list of things to review and to spell out and dig out the past history. However, it is on our list and it has been filled from year to year and we cannot unilaterally wipe it out. It is another one of those negotiated items that is certainly uh, something you bring up in the course of negotiations that uh, we need to have some understanding or some review or what have you, but it is part of the negotiated process. Well, but we do have uh, that, uh, if I uh, recall correctly, some of that is still up in the air and is subject to study and is still subject to negotiation. Well, For example, the grade reps. Yeah, that's true. Uh, mm -hmm. And the relation between uh, the department heads in the high school and the, and the grade reps is totally up in the air, as I understand it, uh, and subject to further negotiation and discussion. Well, the exact sum of money that will be assigned is part of the negotiation discussion. The fact that there is a position is not, has not been challenged by either party to negotiation. That is correct. However, we could choose not to fill a certain position. That's we, correct. We have that right. I, I don't have the contract with me tonight, mm -hmm. but I'm quite sure it's in there. Mm -hmm. Uh, just another question of, of Nancy Hutton. Would, would the Friday morning garage band fall under that? Our, our Friday a.m. garage a. band. That, that would fall under that. That happens that prior, to the, prior, to, school prior to the school day, yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so. The chair needs a motion to accept the list of co-curricular positions for the 1991-1992 school year. So move. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Okay, the last item on that section, uh, it was the item that I asked to add, and that is to explain that Wayne Dorr, who is our uh, Director of Special Services, has been invited by the state um, to serve as an ISG for the upcoming school year. Um, I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, what that means and what it is, so I'll take a moment to explain. That's the Instructional Support Group, the state. Uh, started this uh, process a few years ago uh, in an attempt to bring for a one-year period people who were actual practitioners in the field into the State Department. Um, the state pays their salary for a year um, and it is an opportunity for local teachers to get uh, some um, exposure to what school districts are doing throughout the state because usually they serve on-site reviews for special education purposes in this case or on school approval trips um, and uh, frankly get to see a lot of, of uh, different districts issues as they play out in uh, throughout the state. Um, I apologize for bringing it to you at this time, uh, but uh, Wayne has just been contacted by the state asking him if the Cape Elizabeth School Board would release him for the year. What that means is that his salary would be paid by the state, uh, or we would be reimbursed. Obviously the issue for us is uh, whether we can find a suitable replacement. Um, and uh, my recommendation to you, because I have watched people go through this process in the past, I think that it is a uh, really a healthy and worthwhile uh, process. It is, in, in many respects, it serves like a sabbatical for the staff member, uh, but it's a sabbatical that the board does not have to fund. Uh, so it has some real advantages for you. Um, what we cannot absolutely guarantee is that we will find somebody who has exactly the same kind of set of skills that Wayne has. So what I would assume that if you uh, vote to accept um, to, or to, re, I guess the way to put the motion would be to, um, to release Wayne Dorr as an ISG for the upcoming school year, uh, you might want to put as part of that what 
he himself would understand, I'm sure, and uh, would state, uh, subject to the availability of a suitable substitute, uh, we would then have to advertise and post a position and uh, see what we have for availability. Um, I would be back to you with the results of that search um, at our next board meeting, I would hope. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Connie, would the uh, state uh, not uh, be as likely to accept or want Wayne as a candidate if that restriction were added to his release? Well, I think the, um, I guess it's one of those things that, uh, I'm not sure that you have to make that. I think what my point is, is that I don't believe Wayne himself. I, maybe I should let him speak for himself. Uh, we, we need to find a, a replacement that he is comfortable with, and I know from working with him that that is a, a situation. He's not I believe what he would say is that he doesn't want to walk off and leave us in the lurch. Yeah, that's well put, Connie, because that's exactly uh, the condition that we've talked about, Connie and I have talked about, and it's pretty important to me. The other thing is that... Um, We've discussed um, my returning here one day a week within that uh, condition for the state to manage support and transition. Uh, and that's a process or a, a practice that has been um, done in a couple of systems and it's worked fairly well. I, I don't think that's a problem for the Division of Special Ed, which Mary there. They were very uh, gracious in the comments to ask me to come do this. Madam Chair, I, I don't think the state would want to put any system in a hardship by, by once we committed him to, to take, take this on if we could not find a replacement. Because that would put children in, in jeopardy and I don't think that would be the state's wish. Are there comments? Okay, then the chair needs a motion to release Wayne Dorr as ISG for the 1991-1992 school year, subject to the availability of a suitable substitute. So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that leads us down to no, that's <laughs> <laughs> you were doing fine. Um, <laughs>